Thank you for joining me, Kari. Thank you for and the invitation. First question that I have for you is um, what women have influenced you the most in your life, in your musical experience, overall, everything? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Especially for someone from my generation because musically I really did not have any female mentors mm -hmm. uh, growing up. I think the young women today have such a wellspring and it's thrilling to see um, to see the sponsorship of, of, and the encouragement of women in composition in general, just because mm -hmm. such a low percentage of uh, composers are being performed, female composers are being performed. Right. Um, so, oh gosh, I had a phenomenal mom. I think she is my, uh, obviously, she was a stalwart Norwegian who would not take, who, would, who just never said no. She was able to take on any situation with joy, with creativity, with spontaneity, with amazing spirit. And um, I'm so lucky because when I, when I was a very small child, um, I showed an interest in music and she fanned those flames. And, and she wasn't, mm. you know, my parents weren't in a financial situation to really um, pay for, for lessons. And yet they scraped the money together and they paid for piano lessons mm. and they encouraged me. And that leads me to my second amazing woman. And that was my music teacher whose name was Mary Beth Gilbert. She was, uh, well, you know, being a music teacher, mm -hmm. you know how you inspire and shape the lives of children coming into their musical um, knowledge and understanding. And, oh gosh, she, she, she was a pianist and a performer and a teacher. And yet she went out of her way to encourage my, um, my composition and and you know she she teaching composition is a whole different ball game than teaching piano and it would be easy for a, a music teacher to say uh i you know i don't do that <laughs> let's just stick to piano you know it's safer mm -hmm. to do that but she didn't she plunged right in and she said well let's figure that out what do you think and she engaged me and encouraged me and so i'd say those those two in my early development um, as I got older, you know, I, I, I can't recall having any female professors in music. Isn't that terrible? There were no female composers in the department. I was the only, um, composition. Well, no, wait a minute. I was at the UW and there was an older graduate student and she's still here in Seattle, the amazing Karen Thomas. Okay. So, I saw her way ahead, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as a graduate student, I thought, wow, what she's doing is amazing. Um, but uh, I, I, think it, I think it was a time of transition for women. Mm -hmm. It actually still is a time of transition for women composers. I was just looking at the, at the New York Times a couple days ago and they were looking at statistics of female composers performed by orchestras and it's like two percent yeah it's less than two or three percent it's 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 pretty small yeah so i was lucky though i think your early years are your most delicate as far mm -hmm. as encouraging either collapsing a child's interest or or fanning the flames of their interest you probably For see sure. this yes all the time. yeah but for don't sure you know the kids who are who are sort of innately called. Yes. Yeah, I definitely had that innate calling. And, and to me, it just, I marvel at the fact that something that you can't see and you can't touch can move you so profoundly as a little kid mm -hmm. or as an adult. I mean, right. I, I feel like we're in this sort of, amazing realm of of art where it's it's hard to even talk about it sometimes because it transcends our ability to speak about it i suppose that's why we do it because it transcends yes. our ability to articulate our feelings and emotions about it 
And yeah. it's almost like we tap into it. I mean, I, I can't mm -hmm. count the number of times where I felt like I was sort of in a liminal space and what I was experiencing through music was timeless, but we're completely depending on time and being subject to time and reading it accordingly. And yet the whole experience of it is transcendent. What do you find unique about your experience as a female woman composer? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, well, I mean, just from a very biological sense, we carry within us, if you, if you choose to have children, the probably the most profound act of creation uh, as a mom that I can express was having my two boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the ultimate act of loving creation. And I suppose that deeply informs wonder. It informs um, the depth of how you think about the preciousness of life, mm -hmm. having carried it and having tended it and nurtured it you within your own body i think i think that in itself would give you a different perspective mm -hmm. um because music is that same act of creation and it's entering in it's carrying something within you and it's expressing it's expressing it and then nurturing it so it, i mean in a sense it's it's almost um i wouldn't say it's a, it's unique as for a female you can't judge anybody else's experience of what it means to create something. But I do think that must inform it. Sometimes I will finish a piece and I, I don't really know where it came from. It just, it just sort of came out and I just held it. And I, and I took the time, the hardest, time, the hardest thing really is getting it, getting it down so you can recreate what you've, what you've envisioned. Mm -hmm. But I think you have that same experience as a mom you look at these children who are become people and you just don't know how you got there. It, it's like it pre exist it pre-existed. It was there and you're just kind of uncovering it. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there isn't tons of work and, and just like in parenting, nobody sees that work, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, and nobody sees hopefully when you're, presenting a piece of music nobody knows about the staccatos you put in or how you slurred the strings or mm -hmm. the various effects you put on the woodwind woodwinds or whatever hopefully they just experience that as a unique music. expression yes. of creation yeah so i i think it does inform it i think also um well i don't know i i can't speak for another person's creative perspective you know mm -hmm. i just know that that's i suppose how as a female it's it's affected me mm -hmm. so you've told us a little bit about your journey um as a, in your training and becoming a musician can you tell me a little bit more about um that journey that you've had to where you are today oh sure it's been really fun um i am a true northwest native so i was mm -hmm. born in in Gig harbor I haven't beautiful lost. area. Oh, beautiful area. It's changed. <laughs> it's changed a lot. I'm always in mm -hmm. shock. Now I know why my parents were always responded to how city growth uh, changes a, an environment. <laughs> but I grew up there and went to um, University of Washington. And then at the UW in the process of moving a piano, I was moving a piano into a home on, right by the university bridge because mm -hmm. the year that I went, the dorms were being con reconstructed. There wasn't a lot of housing. That that situation of having a piano being moved and then the movers leaving the piano on the sidewalk because the <gasps> house was so decrepit <laughs> that they were afla afraid it would go through the floorboards. So they were going to charge me to move the piano all the way back. And of course, I was a broke student and I couldn't, I couldn't afford it. So I scrounged around, found a bunch of guys who could lift it and move it. I thought, what the heck, we'll just try and see. And of course, two years later, the boards were still holding the piano. And then I had that wonderful experience of having a piano at hand so I could be inspired. And I, but in that, all that to say, in that process, I met my husband, John, who is a brain scientist. And it was perfect 
combination of arts and sciences. So we actually got married when I was in college. I followed him, he was working on his PhD. I followed him to Washington State University. So I had the experience of both colleges. So I ended up doing my graduate work at Washington State University. And then uh, I, was, I was doing piano performance and music composition. When we moved back to, to Seattle, he was taking, he was gonna start a postdoc. And I just was really tired of academia. I had finished my master's and I had sort of gotten into the whole, at that time, synthesizers were new, digital music was new. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a wonderful, um, oh, a technological delight to explore all these realms. Academia is sort of a, a safe place to be a musician. It's a little yes. scarier <laughs> to jump out and say, okay, I'm going to make a, try to make a living in Seattle. Yeah, right. LA might have been a different picture, but I started working in recording studios and I learned a lot of technology. So I started working with PBS and KCPS and working, mm -hmm. um, doing background scores for uh, PBS series. So nice. that was that was so fascinating. I learned a lot about serving um, a visual story. What does it mean? Because from an academic perspective, you ask, you often go into music saying, "Here I am." Isn't this music profound? That sometimes over informs what you choose to compose. So suddenly you're in this perspective where your whole view is to serve the emotional content of what's or the whatever the visual content is to serve it in such a way that you're not distracting from it serving the emotional components you're serving the experience that the viewer has had is it da -da 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 where there's the threat of the two creatures meeting or is it the da -da 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 -da? that was a fantastic um that was a fantastic uh first step I think in learning how to work in a recording studio, how to use all the technology. I was, I was uh, one of the downsides, of course, of this, this realm and particularly in that time is they were realizing that you could replace live instruments with digital instruments. It's, it's really sad because what they used to do was hire out entire ensembles and record them and use it. And, and ideally that's what you do when you have a big budget, but right. most of the product, the small productions just don't have that. And so they just hire someone and you as a composer become the performer of everything. Um, what that does, it, you, what, what you lose out on is the wisdom and the input that a performer that's a specialty in their instrument would bring to a live performance. So after a couple of years of doing that, um, I really was hungry for that live interaction with real human beings. So the recording studio environment is intoxicating. It's, it talk about timeless. I mean, this is all sense of time and space. You're in the moment. You're yes. working on this piece of music and the whole world fades to black. But you can't <laughs> live that way for a long time because the rest of the world goes on. Um, so I, I did enjoy that experience. It was a very male, it, it was a very male environment at the time that I was doing it. Actually, it still is. We, we I was looking at our, you know, the list. We, we now finally have some encouragement for women to go into film scoring and you're seeing a lot of them being, mm -hmm. um, being lauded, but I really miss that interaction with musicians. I, I miss their wisdom. I miss learning from them. Um, so I thought, okay, I need to find a job where I'm working with human beings and we're making music. And the other thing is about the, the serving the environment is that you're always serving the vision of a producer. Mm -hmm. And their tendency is to use what we call the time needle drop, but they used libraries of music that they would drop in, right? Mm -hmm. And then they say, I, I want something like that. And it, it collapses your um, ability to be freeform as far mm -hmm. as 
creative. You, you truly are in this serving environment, but it is a different experience musically. You're trying mm-hmm. to reproduce the look, feel, the meter, the ambience, the aesthetic of this, something that someone else has chosen. There's a couple of filmmakers, I think, who do it the other way and cut to the composers. And I really, oh, I so admire that. I, because they're trusting the composers to yes. bring their own expertise. And again, that's what I was thrilled about working with live musicians, again, bringing, and it's what I love working mm-hmm. with you all, because each of you has such a unique perspective and unique expertise and such great ideas. And composers can, you know, you, you, composers can bring the score, but we don't bring the life. You breathe the life into it. So then I got a wonderful job working as a music director um, at University Presbyterian Church in Seattle, close by the district, Mm -hmm. um, and created, I just built a really big program. It was a big tent kind of vision where I said, if you, if you play it, let's use it. Let's write for it. Let's, so it was so much fun. We had everything from, we had accordion and handbells and a gospel choir and a chamber choir and a woodwind ensemble and a string ensemble. And every week I would write for a different style. So we'd go from acapella folk music or kind of Celtic stuff with a Celtic vibe to gospel stuff to um, woodwind ensemble type of stuff, um, strings, whatever. It was, it was wonderful. And it was, it was weekly designed around um, what, whatever the pastor was preaching on at that time. I had the wonderful experience of writing every week for whatever ensemble was available. And so I learned a lot about um, the practicality of writing when you only have one rehearsal. I mean, that's, that's, that in itself is an amazing practicality because it's easy when you're working by yourself, writing on your computer to, to let your players do anything, right? And not even think about range and breathing and all the practical things you need to bring. And I mean, we had to, it had to be easy enough that we could rehearse it in, one or two rehearsals you know you you always have this vision in your brain of of things that are really out there that that could that could take weeks and days and months to rehearse and perform live but the very practical side of that is there are not going to be many times in your life unless you hire uh, an orchestra or an ensemble right and very few of us are in the position to be musicians and hire our own performers. So it made me practical and pragmatic. And it was just so fun. It was so fun to to have this pivot every week to a new ensemble, a new expression. And to also work with a, our our congregation was very gracious and very, um, uh, very supportive of trying new things. And, And so to have that immediate response and to know, you know, when you have someone come up to you, I'm sure you have this experience when you have a a concert back in the old days when things were live. Uh, it means so much to have someone come up and say, you know, I was really moved by that, or I needed that this week, or, I mean, this is, this is where our music moves from being in our heads to being an expression of, of grace and kindness and a gift to other people. And that breathes life into it. That's when it goes from paper into a, a true, I don't even know how to just dis- express it, but it's that liminal space that I was talking about where you're moving from something aesthetic into something that's um, living in the world, doing good work. I'll, I, I will end it by just by saying that I, for the last, um, my boys graduated in, my son graduated in 2018 um, from high school. And so I have spent the last, um, four to five years just in a musical playground it's like I'm going back now fantastic I can write whatever I want I can I can explore I can re uh, in sort of re-imagine what I want to do musically Mm -hmm. so and that is I I feel like I'm in a playpen (laughs) I really do it's it's fantastic it's it's 
a wonderful position to be in. So I am savoring that. So um, Anapkara, oh my gosh, such a beautiful, beautiful piece. This was a great experience because this is one that we got to record in person and together. And what a blessing that was. So I would love to hear more about your inspiration and the background of Anamkara. Oh, wonderful. Well, I was so overjoyed to, to be there. And, you know, that was my first experience being in a studio for, for three years. Wow. I, I mean, I, I just felt like all of us were celebrating the goodness of finally being with humans and hearing <laughs> live in a space. And, and you know, having coming from it, recording it by yourself, what happens when you're all together in the same place, working towards the same piece of music, uh, it's, there's nothing like it. Right. There's absolutely nothing. I, I mentioned previously that my husband is a brain scientist and, and there is brain science to this. Yes. It, it releases oxytocin in the brain, which is our, our sense that all is well with the world. It's our bonding chemical. It's the, it's the, it's the hormone in our brain um, that connects us to, to children. It's, it's all of that. And it mm -hmm. happens when a choir is singing together, when a group is, well, you, you can actually hear it in a sports event, you know, when everybody's chanting together. Yes. Yes. Even when it's very primal like that, it's, it is a bonding thing. So I definitely felt that as you guys were, were playing together and working off each other. Um, and it was such a per perfect metaphor for the piece itself. Anamkara <laughs> means soul friend. It's a Gaelic concept of what is an Anamkara is is the friend who who is there for you outside of time and space. There, there. It doesn't matter if you're separated or whatever. You get back together. You're right there in the same emotional space of friendship. And it's, mm -hmm. but it's not the you know let's go out for drinks kind of friendship. It's the, it's the deep, deep core friendship. It's a, it's the friend who challenges you to be the best person you can be and, and, mm -hmm. and brings out all the, the beauty in you as a, the, the luminous beauty of you as a human being. Um, so uh, I felt like you guys were totally an expression of that. It was like a double metaphor because the piece itself, the, the, the little sections echo off of each other each instrument is is grabbing hold of this idea and and affirming it and then moving on with their idea of it and then another instrument comes along and affirms that motif mm -hmm. and uh, and moves it a little bit farther in. and so you feel like you're in this little journey where people are listening to each other and affirming each other and then calling you into something and i love that because i think particular right now coming out of um coming out of the pandemic, we're all so hungry for that friendship. We're all so lonely for that sense of, of being known. There's something, you know, we're in a culture where it's all about trying to be known online, right? And yet there's something that's that's deeply not, not soulfully satisfying about that. That creates, I think more than anything, a panic in people to feel like they need to be something that they're not or to present themselves in a particular way or to create a, a persona that other people will will think is glamorous, but trying to always live in that space is not healthy for humanity. And I see it in, in kids. There's an anxiety, and a, it erodes at the core at their core acceptance of who they are. So I think we are all particularly hungry for that because we've been in this space, you know, where we're, I mean, not to say that Zoom is not one of the greatest gifts. I mean, I love the fact that, <laughs> isn't it amazing that through yes. this, you could connect, that people in the hospital could connect with those they loved, that mm -hmm. um, families can connect around the world. I mean, we have a, we have a weekly Zoom with our, our sons who are in college. And some, uh, one of them was in Colombia, and one of them was in California, and we were here. And you know, it, it you can be anywhere in the world and share life's experiences together. That's really amazing. Yes. But what I'm talking about is the the friendship of being safe in being known. When mm -hmm. you feel safe and accepted and um, cherished 
it'll, it frees you to be creative. I mean, this is true. This is another brain idea. Children and people learn best when they feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, and it also allows for the greatest, uh, the greatest creativity. Yes. If you feel you people who are under incredible stress and feel like they could always, there's a chance they might fail and, and they have to keep, they have to be perfect. That kind of pressure does not uh, nurture taking risk and creativity mm -hmm. demands taking risk. If you, mm -hmm. I'm sure you see teachers where there's so much pressure that the kid is just shaking and they're, they're just going to play the notes. You know, they're just mm -hmm. going to play the notes because there's no permission to take the risk of thinking outside the box a little bit. What if I play with this? What happens if For I sure. do this? You have to be safe. You have to have a loving environment. You have to feel like you're cherished and then you you blossom and fly. Uh -huh. So I do think that Anamkara concept is, is such a beautiful thing. It's just a beautiful mm -hmm. idea, a soul friend who embraces who you are as a person and and friends you through that journey 